Hi there, my name is Mark Downey. I am a program manager on the Visual Studio Production Diagnostics team. And today I'd like to talk to you about debugging memory dumps with Visual Studio. For problems that do not manifest in logs or that you cannot investigate by debugging locally, you might attempt to capture a diagnostic artifact like a memory dump. Capturing a memory dump in essence is like taking a high fidelity photo of your application. It represents a single moment in time. It's kind of the equivalent of stopping your application at a breakpoint. A memory dump is typically taken when an app running in production is exhibiting some behavior that you need to mitigate. Unfortunately for most scenarios, attaching a debugger like Visual Studio in production environments is typically not practical or even possible. To navigate this limitation, we can capture a memory dump and copy that file to our local PCs and then open that file in Visual Studio and use the same set of first-class live debugging tools we've grown accustomed to. Today, I'm going to show you how easy it is to get important insights from a variety of memory dumps. So the dump I want to look at today are referred to as crash dumps. Um, and a crash is simply when your app unexpectedly termin terminates. And we usually capture a crash dump right at that critical moment. So there are many reasons an app might crash. Um, the most common are typically unhandled exceptions. These occur where an exception is raised. Uh, that's a first chance exception. But your code does not handle it very well. The exception goes up the stack and becomes what we refer to as a second chance exception and crashes your process. So in order to capture a memory dump of any kind, I tend to rely on tools like proc dump. Um, this is from sysinternals. There's lots of documentation on this. Um, it's a CLI it's a command line tool that allows you to kind of capture dumps under a variety of circumstances. In fact, they have a nice set of parameters that allow you to capture it for maybe CPU thresholds or for um, or, or because maybe you have too much memory. Um, towards the bottom here, they have a nice list of examples for you to pull from so I can capture a full dump of a particular process ID. I can capture a memory dump if it's exceeded 20% of the CPU for an extended amount of time. Um, I can capture a, um, you know, capture a memory dump if I see a particular type of exception. All these are great ways of capturing a variety of kind of memory dumps and we'll look at a few of those um, over the course of this video. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and open a crash dump that I've collected by hitting Control O in Visual Studio, which opens up um, the file open window. And I've got a dump and the extension is .dmp here, crash stack overflow and some managed dump. This is one of the ones I use for examples here. So I'm going to go ahead and open that. And that lands me immediately on the memory dump file summary page, the mini dump file summary page. And it has some really important information, obviously the name of the file, but the last, basically essentially when this dump was taken, the last write that was taken to this file, um, it takes me the, gives me the process name, the application running as, uh, as. Um, it gives me the process architecture and things like the exception code. These are things that we, the exception code, especially is something that you can use Bing and search for to find out more details. Um, about that. Gives you the OS version and the CLR version. And really importantly, it gives you a list and version of the modules that were loaded by this particular process. So I can use that to identify maybe if there's version mismatches um, in, in my assumed environment. Um, on the right hand side are the important actions you can take against this memory dump. Um, certainly starting with things like setting symbols. So as part of your build process, you'll probably produce a bunch of program database, program database files, which essentially help you marry up um, your code to events in memory um, that are kind of occurring in the process. So I could, essentially, if there's an issue, I can get right to a, a particular line of code that's associated with it by setting the symbol path. Um, the most important action for managed applications is to debug with managed only. Um, some of you will have scenarios with uh, either native or mixed applications, but for, this, for the sake of this particular demonstration, we're gonna focus on debug with managed only. So I'm going to go ahead and hit debug with managed only and start my debugging session. What this is going to do is make it as if I am at a breakpoint right at the very moment this exception occurred, 
right at the moment this, un this, this particular exception occurred or this crass exception was captured. And so what that set sets for me is an, a perfect opportunity for me to review this as and use all the tools I am used to when I'm live debugging. So let's take, for example, this exception helper. This is a typical exception helper we would see during live debugging if we were to get against, if we were to capture a, a, a unhandled exception. And it's telling me um, quite explicitly that um, that we have an exception of type system dot stack overflow exception type. And again, this is just like a, any live debugging, except for obvious course, of course, I cannot go forward. I cannot use F5 or anything like that. All I can do is look at the details of this particular moment in time. So I'm going to view details. I'm going to click on the view details and that will pop up the quick watch window. And again, I can get way more details about the exceptions here. If there's inf additional information on the in exception, I can use that or additional information in, in the um, message exception. I can also use that. Um, this is just a great way of gathering much more data about this particular scenario. Given that this is a Stack Overflow exception, um, I'm thinking about the fact that this is out of memory, essentially, um, and it's run out of, essentially, frames on the call stack. So because it's running out of frames on the call stack, I want to actually go to the call stack window, and I've got mine down the bottom here, click on the call stack window. And what, I'll, what you'll notice here is we've literally run out of frames and Visual Studio has intelligently um, pared down the number of frames I could view here. So I can see what the root of this call stack overflow exception is. And obviously it starts in main and I've got an, a method called infinite recurse. It's obviously quite deliberate. And then it tells me how many times it's essentially repeated the number of frames and you can see that I've repeated these number of frames over almost 20,000 times, right? So at this point, I kind of know the origins of the Stack Overflow exception. And it would be great at this moment if I could look at the code there just to double check any assumptions right here. So I can actually double click on the call stack. And what that will do at this moment, I don't have my symbols, uh, uh, my PDB files lined up. Um, so what I could do here is decide, actually go get my symbols, maybe from my build machine, or I can go ahead and, and that's the best way, or if I don't have those handy, I can go ahead and decompile the source code and that will pull me directly into the line of code. And it looks just like a live session now. I'm sitting here at what is essentially a recursive uh, function calling itself. This is the issue that I have and now I can go ahead and resolve that and maybe start a open a case with my developers and tell them how to resolve this particular issue. One scenario I really love using memory dump analysis for revolves around growth in the memory footprint of your process. So when there is unaccounted for growth over time and unchecked growth over time, I like the idea of using a memory dump to analyze where that growth might be coming from and whether it's really healthy or not. So I may see growth in my memory footprint of an application over the course of hours or days. And if I don't see that memory recovering, I may decide that this is a great opportunity to use two memory dumps, one taken at the beginning and one taken at the end and kind of compare how, where the growth is coming from and to see if it's possible that this memory will, will be reclaimed. If it won't be reclaimed, that is something that I then need to resolve. So let's like have a look at that process. So if you want to collect a memory dump, I typically start with a tool like .NET GC dump. Um, this is a great command line tool and you can create essentially a dump that's really super compact um, and just concerns itself with the heap. You don't get to see threads. You don't get to see values of particular objects. You just simply get a list of objects on the heap and their sizes. And this is just a great compact way of comparing two memory snapshots. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Control O in Visual Studio and open up the memory dump. This is the, actually the second of two memory dumps that I've taken. I would have taken one at the start after restarting the application because I want to understand the nature of the growth. And then I would have taken a second memory dump once that growth has 
been I've reached that growth mechanism where I think it's obvious that they am having um, unreclaimed growth so I'm going to pick open up the second of the two dumps so that I know what the situation is once I'm um, once I've leaked my memory and so this opens up the managed memory viewer um, for Visual Studio and it shows me a list of object types and it tells me the count of those object types, the size of the actual object itself is the first one, size in bytes, and then inclusive size includes anything that that particular object references directly. So for example, I've got a list object as my first one, and it has a size of 8,000 bytes. Um, however, the inclusive size, that is including, including the things it's referencing inside the list, it's close to, to 16 million bytes or 16, rather than 16 meg. So in my mind's eye, I'm immediately thinking to myself, these are likely culprits for my growth. So these, these, this is obvious place to start. Um, now, um, a normal application here, um, it may not be this obvious, which is why I think the ability to compare to your other, your original memory dump, the one you captured first as the baseline is incredibly important. And so I'm going to go ahead and click on compare with and go ahead and open what is the baseline, the first memory dump I took. And this allows me to compare the first memory dump to the second memory dump. And again, now I am conclusively kind of seeing where the growth is. It's definitely in data records. I'm seeing this, in, this, this increased by an incredible amount, by a thousand or so. Um, but the question really is, why didn't I reclaim this? Why wasn't this memory reclaimed? This is a, look like a regular list. Um, why isn't this list gone away? I, you know, I've taken these two memory dumps at two separate points. And if I go and look at the path to root, it makes it quite obvious to me that this list is in fact a static variable. And if you know about static variables, you know that they actually hang around for the entire lifetime of the process. So this won't be cleaned up unless I am deliberate about cleaning up. So here I found what is essentially a leak in a static list. So in addition to things like crashes or memory leaks, I also like to think about how we can use memory dumps when your app isn't responding correctly, when it's slow or completely unresponsive. And for that, I often like to use the parallel stacks windows in Visual Studio. The parallel stacks window is a great way to get the big picture view about an application that you're using. My friends in um, our debugging and diagnostics team like to think of the approach to debugging as thinking about the big picture first. We wanna think about what the condition of our threads are. And then once we've figured out what the threads are doing, maybe we identify a particular call stack on a particular thread. And then from there, we might dive deeper and get to code and objects and look at the analysis from that perspective. So the way in which we can use the parallel stacks window is to think from big picture and we slowly get closer and closer to the problem at hand. Let's dive in. So I have some great friends in the open source community who have created this application. It is designed um, to kind of mimic the stock market in some way, but they've deliberately created it so that essentially it becomes unresponsive after a few moments. And I'd like to use Visual Studio to help us understand why it's doing that. So I have um, started my debug action with debug with managed only. I've kind of started up and I'm gonna go ahead and navigate because I wanna see the big picture here. So I'm gonna go ahead and navigate to the parallel stack window. I can use that by going to the debug window, debug windows and parallel stacks. And I wanna see the big picture here. So here what it does is give me a graphical overview of all the threads currently running in this application. So I'm gonna scroll here, I'm actually gonna zoom out just a little bit so I can see a little bit more of the, of the threads here. You'll see it'll show the relationships between, uh, with, between threads. Um, it'll show the co unique call stacks that each of these threads are running. So for example, as a big thought in my head that I'm seeing this, I'm seeing 90 threads over here on the right hand side. I'm seeing 89 of those threads here and one going in this direction. Same, similarly over here, I have three threads and these are the unique portions. So of these three threads here, this is the common portion right here and they split off and go in their different directions up here. 
Okay, so what's interesting to me is this little icon. Um, you'll notice this icon here um, at, that is representative of a deadlock. Now, the fact that we have an unresponsive app and Parallel Stacks is immediately telling us that we have a deadlock scenario. That's really, really important because now I'm starting to think about the ways in which we get deadlocks. So from a purely uh, hypothetical or from a theoretical standpoint, excuse me, you would think about a deadlock as essentially thread A having a lock and waiting for a lock that another thread owns. And typically what usually happens is that thread B is then waiting on the first thread to release a lock that it owns. So we have this kind of deadlock situation where both threads are waiting for, for the other thread to release something. So now my job is to find out where those where that deadlock is originating from. So again, so I'm gonna use this, um, this window here to kind of review the threads. And here, just kind of looking, um, what I'm seeing, especially right over here, obviously I've got 90 threads, so these are all going to wait. They're gonna to continue to wait indefinitely. And if I look here on the on thread 7048, what I've noticed is that it's waiting on a lock that is owned by thread 28964. And so I'm gonna go find thread 28964 and see what it's waiting for. So if I go over to thread 28964 over here, I've noticed that it's waiting on a, on a, on a lock owned by thread 7048. So ex exactly the deadlock scenario. We have one thread waiting on a lock that is owned by another thread. Simultaneously, that other thread is waiting on a lock owned by the first thread. This is where our deadlock is occurring. And Parallel Stacks Windows kind of shouting that out to me. Um, what would be interesting right now is that I'd like to see the code that both this worker thread and this cat crump grumpy thread is running. So what I can do here is double click on the frame um, that is essentially doing the waiting here. So the monitor enter is actually some core code from system.threading, but this looks like um, user code or is in fact user code. So I'm gonna go ahead and double click there. And if I had symbols from my build process, I could go find them and associate them and load them here, but I don't. So I'm gonna go ahead and de decompile the source code and now I see the locks I've been mentioning. So I have a lock on buyer and a lock on orders. Actually a lock on seller, buyer and orders. Interesting. So let's go back to parallel stacks window and do that same exercise for the other thread. So we are going to uh, go and look at this thread and we double click on that frame and this time we have orders and sellers. So let's go between, so that's interesting. If you remember the other thread was sellers and orders. This one is orders and sellers. Essentially, this is a typical deadlock scenario. If we want to eliminate this problem, we have to ensure that our locks are done in the same order. So both threads should lock orders and sellers in that order or sellers and orders in that order to avoid the deadlock scenario. Thank you for joining today. I hope this helped in your understanding of how Visual Studio can be used to help you debug managed memory dumps. Um, good luck hunting those bugs.